everyone. My name is Sonia Subramanian, and I'm a software engineer at Google. I'm here today to welcome a dear friend and one of my earliest childhood inspirations, Dr. Vinod Krishan. I still remember the first time I met Vinod. I was 11 or 12 years old and was going to meet my school classmate and best friend's mom, a scientist in astrophysics. I could not have been more excited if I were off to meet Supergirl. It's with the same excitement and a deep sense of honor and privilege that I introduce her to you all, Dr. Vinod Krishan, scientist, retired senior professor and dean of sciences at the Indian Institute of Astrophysics and author of three books on astrophysical plasmas, one of which, Plasmas, The First State of Matter, I've just started to read. Her amazing and rewarding career over multiple decades in this field took her around the world on collaborations and visiting professorships at world-renowned institutes like the Lawrence Berkeley Labs, California, Space Sciences Institute, Brazil, and others. She was awarded the Vikram Sarabhai Award for Space Sciences, a distinguished award in India in 1992. Vinod is with us today to introduce us to the fascinating world of plasmas with a talk entitled The Plasma Universe. As she takes us through this talk, I'm sure you'll have questions. Please add them to the chat and we will get to as many as we can. With that, let's welcome Vinod. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Google, for giving me this opportunity. And I thank Sonia for her kind words and uh, affectionate words, rather. And uh, I also thank Farha very deeply for organizing this uh, event. And uh, it is due to the hard work of Sonia and Farah that this has been possible. So I'm really grateful to Google for this opportunity. Uh, so I shall start my talk, uh, as Sonia mentioned, the title of my talk is The Plasma Universe, Plasmas being the first state of matter. And Sonia had also asked me to uh, display uh, some, uh, some of my books. So this is these are the three books she mentioned, and she has shown one of them. The, the books were also published in, in the same order. Uh, astrophysical plasmas and fluids was the first one I wrote. And also, let me say that this was the most uh, advanced uh, book I have written. And I, as I grew older and perhaps wiser, so I started simplifying. So the next book is simpler than the first one, and the third one is simpler than the second one. So I shall try to uh, make my presentation. Uh, as simple as possible, but as Einstein said, we should make science simple, but not simpler. So I will stick to that. So the plan of my talk is first just an introduction to various locales in, in the universe where one can see plasmas, in fact, everywhere, almost everywhere. And then I shall give a brief introduction to plasmas in laboratory, plasma materials and methods types of plasmas, there are various kinds of plasmas. And then a little bit of um, uh, theoretical background, like what's a plasma, defining a plasma, and what are the kind of techniques we use to study and investigate the plasma phenomena. So uh, perhaps uh, some of you might have uh, read in your uh, undergraduate, Plasmas being the fourth state of matter. That is how it has been introduced. It is still being introduced. And I was also introduced the same way. And the reason for that was that solids, uh, one in the, in the terrestrial context, one starts with a solid and heats it to make it a liquid, which then on further heating becomes a gas and which on further heating will become a plasma. So that is why it is known as the fourth state of matter. But that is true only on the terra firma. In the universe, uh, this is not true. This is not how nature has made plasmas. That is not how nature does it. Universe originated in a hot soup of plasmas and exactly the opposite sequence of events took place. 
First it was plasma, then gas. As the universe cooled and expanded, so the plasmas became gas and gas became liquefied and then the solid. So it is exactly in the opposite manner that the universe uh, started. So I would like to, I have been trying to propagate that plasma is the first state of matter and not the fourth state of matter. So this kind of uh, experiments are going on, very high energy uh, experiments are going on at CERN in Geneva to understand the early stages of the universe. And this slide I show just to emphasize the fact that the earliest observable state of the universe is a plasma, is a quark gluon plasma. As I go along, I will uh, explain further about these uh, terms. Uh, so what's a plasma? A plasma is a mixture of positively and negatively charged particles along with some neutral particles. So we take a gas and ionize it. That is what we do on Earth. Uh, the term plasma <clears throat> first suggested by Irving Langmuir in 1939 while studying the electric discharges of gases by passing high electric current through cesium atoms. A plasma has very different properties from its parent neutral gas. So that is why it is actually, it is thermodynamically speaking, it is not strictly speaking a fourth uh, state of matter or, or actually rather a state of matter because uh, it does not have some of those uh, characteristics that we find when we study, uh, you know, change of phase, for example, from water to ice or water to uh, 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 vapors. So it doesn't have some of those characteristics, but it has so many different properties and characteristic properties that it has earned the status of a state of matter. The universe began in an extremely hot plasma soup of elementary particles. Now, what are these elementary particles? So the, uh, the thumb rule is that given the energy, what are the whatever particles can exist at, at those energies are allowed. We may not be able to observe those particles. Even in the lab, we are not able to observe all the particles that might exist in the, might have existed in the early stages of the uh, formation of the universe. So as, it, as the universe expands and cools, recombination sets in, which means the electrons and the protons, they combine to make hydrogen atoms. And this is called the neutralization of the plasma. The earliest, and this gives rise to partially ionized plasma. So the earliest universe fully ionized because it's extremely hot, extremely dense. And uh, so there were no atoms, there were no hydrogen atoms. But as the universe expanded and cooled, so the hydrogen atoms uh, formed and uh, more and more of the electrons and protons uh, recombined. Actually, even this term recombined is a kind of misnomer because there was no combination before this. This is the first time uh, they combine. So then the, the a stage comes when there's a complete neutralization, which lasts until the first quasars and galaxies are born. So their UV radiation, that is ultraviolet radiation, initiates the deionization epoch of the universe. So once again, the universe starts to ionize and the state of partial ionization and later on in different locales, fully ionized plasmas uh, come into existence. So this is a brief history of the uh, universe and I hope you can see this slide. So this is the earliest, the Big Bang. And, that, and uh, so this is like, like about 15 billion years ago. And as the universe expanded and cooled, various stages of ionization of the matter uh, come into existence and then uh, the, uh, and the, the bottom shows the present uh, state of the universe where we see galaxies, stars, clusters of galaxies, quasars and all the other objects. So this is the timeline of the universe.
So a set of partial ionization, as I mentioned, hydrogen atoms, electrons, and protons, they uh, come into existence. And there is a particular spectral line. So each atom, for example, in the laboratory or anywhere, has its own spe uh, specific spectral uh, emission lines and absorption lines. Uh, and these have very, very fixed, uh, depending on upon the structure of the atom, number of uh, electrons and protons. Uh, they have a very uh, specific, well-studied uh, spectra, electromagnetic spectra. And uh, so this uh, neutral hydrogen has a very uh, special line, which is at is a wavelength of 21 centimeters. So coll collisional excitation of 21 centimeter radiation, that is electron hydrogen atom collisions, is a very important diagnostics of the early universe. So one has to uh, you know, observe this, this is rather a low frequency uh, radiation as compared to, for example, optical radiation, which would have uh, a wavelength of uh, 5,000 angstroms, for example, from the sun. What we you are observing, at least I am observing right now, uh, solar radiation at uh, wavelength of 5,000 angstroms. So this is a radio, uh, it, this lies in the radio radiation, 21 centimeter. And so there are several low frequency observing facilities planned to observe the red shifted 21 centimeter spectral line. Red shifted, so it will become actually even longer wavelength. And so there, there are like issues of the ionospheric uh, propagation of this radiation through the ionospheric because it is low frequency, it may suffer some absorption and uh, uh, other changes while it propagates through the ionosphere. So radiation propagation through a partially ionized plasma is a very important uh, subject to understand the early stages of the universe. And there may be damping of the radiation due to collisions between electrons and ions and electrons and neutrals and other uh, possible sources of damping. So let me also introduce you very briefly some of the Indian astronomical observatories which are operating right now. So this is the Kodaknal Solar Observatory. It's a very ancient, uh, more than 200 years old uh, observatory. It is with our institute, Indian Institute of Astrophysics. And this is located at the southern tip of the so-called Palani Hills. And uh, this was established in 1899. And this is still operational. And it has a lot of uh, you know, archival data, which uh, is accessible to anybody in the world, any, to all astronomers who wish to uh, study this uh, data. You know, we need these uh, long uh, time data in order to understand the evolution of the system. This is another observatory at uh, nearby from Bangalore. Uh, this, it has a uh, optical, this is a nighttime telescope and it has a uh, uh, diameter of 93 inches uh, mirror of the telescope. Asia's biggest telescope, 3.7 meter at Devasthal Optical Observatory is in the northern part of the country. And uh, so this has been operational since last uh, few years. This is a radio observatory right here in the uh, southern west, in the western near uh, Mumbai, a giant meter wave radio telescope. So this observes at radio wavelength. So as you might have realized that we need uh, um, different telescopes to observe the objects at different uh, spectral regions. So this is the first Indian astro satellite which was launched uh, some time back and it is uh, giving very valuable data right now. So with, there are also two types of astronomical instruments are usually used. The first category includes all instruments that are used for observations, such as the telescopes. The second category pertains to instruments employed for recording or standardizing the data provided by the observational instruments. Spectrographs may be used to evaluate light, whereas photoelectric cells can be employed to measure luminosity. So this is in a very brief way, how do we observe and how do we uh, uh, get the data uh, about the astronomical observe, objects. So more, let me give you some more examples of astrophysical plasmas. Um, this is an Orion molecular cloud. And I think you would have seen this Orion constellation quite a few times. 
this is a live you know live star formation uh, region right now the star form stars are forming there and uh, so these are i've just given you some parameters here which may not mean much to you right now but it just tells us that we are able to uh, um, estimate uh, what are the number densities of the particles of the electrons and neutral particles hydrogen atoms and uh, this is all uh, you know inferred from the observations we take of these objects then there is diffuse interstellar between the stars gas in two forms cold clouds of neutral atomic or molecular hydrogen and ionized hydrogen near hot young stars so there again we observe these uh, uh, regions by taking their spectra luminosity and by every possible means to understand what's going on there what are the kind of matter what form the matter exists and this is what tells us whether the matter is ionized whether it's a plasma or it's a neutral or it's a partially ionized plasma <clears throat> this is an accretion disk where a compact star is uh, accreting matter from another star so the compact star is here and uh, matter is being accreted from a neighboring star which is a binary and making a disk around this uh, compact object so this is a very important and very frequently occurring phenomena in the universe we have lots of binary in fact you may not believe that more stars are in a binary state than in a single state and uh, so this phenomena is quite uh, uh, useful for us to as a diagnostics of the system because accretion is can be observed uh, by their x ray emission or optical emission sun which is a plasma physics laboratory it is called because it's a fully made of plasma right from the center of the sun to its uh, atmosphere which is photosphere which is what gives us this visible light uh, and uh, and also the external uh, layers which are corona uh, which can be observed only during the solar eclipse so all through from the center of the sun to the observable uh, part of the sun during the eclipse is all fully made of plasmas so therefore it's called and so there's a rich a variety of phenomena which are occurring in the uh, on the sun and that is why this is a favorite object of plasma physicists because every type of plasma phenomena can be uh, studied observed and even theoretically uh, we try to model these phenomena with our uh, knowledge of plasma physics so this these are you know these you see these loops these are plasma loops and why are they curved because the plasma is following the magnetic field so as if you recall from your school days you have iron filings around a bar magnet and you see these patterns this is almost a similar pattern you can observe here and this is a very high resolution uh, uh, picture and we try to understand how these loops are formed what are their lifetimes how do they fall back etc and what is the underlying magnetic field and so on <laughs> solar eclipse as i uh, mentioned so this is the outermost layer of the sun chromosphere and the corona which is which we can study the corona is at million degrees and the photosphere as you know is 6000 degrees and that is why we get the visible light but the outermost layer of the sun is at million degrees million degrees kelvin so this is actually a big problem in plasma physics how the outer regions of a star because the, all the energy is coming from the center of the star and propagating outside so as one moves away from the star the temperature should fall but it, it is exactly the opposite that the visible surface of the sun is at a temperature of 6000 degrees kelvin and the outermost layer is at million degrees kelvin this is an ongoing uh, you know problem challenge for plasma physicists for solar physicists to explain this uh, extremely hot uh, stage of the outermost layers so let me just remember so they, again uh, i would like to emphasize that uh, as i said sun is a plasma physics laboratory and it has not only one kind of temperature variation i have already mentioned to you that we have 6000 and then we have million degrees but in between we have all sorts of cold and hot regions we have cold prominences which rise and then fall back on onto the sun 
we have dark ridges uh, in the uh, images which have temperatures less than 20000 uh, degree kelvins and we have million degrees, we have 20,000 degrees, we have even lowered the temperatures than that. So there are a lot of structure on the solar surface um, with hot and cold. So it is, it is actually quite interesting to um, uh, model these structures and how they can coexist, uh, hot and cold, how can they coexist for a finite amount of time? Because otherwise plasma should mix up and they should attain a common temperature, but it doesn't happen. They exist with their own temperatures uh, for a, a measure, um, finite amount of time. So another region where one can see plasmas in the comet tails. So this blue region is a plasma tail, and uh, this is a dust tail uh, as, the, as the comet approaches uh, near the sun the matter gets ionized. And so these, these two tails have very different properties. And we like to model these structures, uh, including these plasmas. And one thing, uh, wherever there is a plasma, so, and there is a magnetic field, because magnetic field is very intimately connected with charges. Charges move, produce currents, and currents produce magnetic field. So this plasma magnetic field interaction is a very basic ingredient of all plasma phenomena. Coronal mass ejections hits Earth, causing aurora. This beautiful aurora, and there are, I think, it's commonly seen uh, in the North Pole and other regions. Let me now come to plasmas in laboratory. So, plasmas based display systems, uh, I think everyone is quite familiar with that. So what happens here, the electrons, electrodes placed in a partially evacuated tube with an inert gas and some small traces of mercury vapor. So what happens, electric discharge first uh, ionizes the gas and it, it, the ionized gas produces UV radiation, ultraviolet radiation, and which when hits the fluorescent material, which is on the surface of the electrode, and it gives rise to this design, whatever design, the first uh, this uh, fluorescent uh, coating, it gives rise to the uh, display. So this is an important, very important aspect of plasma physics. As I mentioned that in the interior of sun, the nuclear reactions take place, which is the source of energy. And it is an everlasting source of energy. And people, scientists, especially plasma physicists, are trying to uh, mimic those conditions on Earth. And it is a very daunting task, to say the least, uh, about, uh, you know, um, about 50 years back, we thought it, in another 20 years, we'll have uh, these thermonuclear fusion reactions and an everlasting clean source of energy. but the uh, date has been shifting and uh, we are uh, we have come a long way we have understood many uh, complex uh, phenomena or challenges that are there in this area in trying to achieve uh, thermonuclear nuclear reactions but uh, we still don't know when we will be able to achieve so this is the largest tokamak existing right now it is called eater uh, it is uh, uh, I think about uh, 30 countries are participating in this experiment, uh, tokamak experiment. So basically a tokamak structure with uh, very high density plasmas and temperatures of nearly 100 million uh, degrees, Kelvin degrees, uh, to, uh, carry, uh, to facilitate the fusion reactions. So this is an ongoing project and a lot of work is uh, going on. Every day there is some news about it and maybe you can keep track of that. There's another way of producing uh, fusion reactions and that is uh, another uh, stream of uh, research where uh, many, in fact, as you see the number here, 100, 192 laser beams, highest intensity uh, power lasers uh, are uh, shining on a target, which is a hydrogen fuel target and trying to compress the target and also uh, trying to heat it to facilitate the nuclear reactions. So this is uh, happening at the National 
ignition facility in uh, uh, in this lab uh, in California. And this is uh, another example where there are a lot of uh, you know expectation and work uh, being done in uh, terms of finding a very efficient fuel. So plasma rockets. So right now, I think there is a liquid propulsion, and earlier it was solid uh, fuel propulsion uh, uh, in the rockets. And the latest now is an effort to have plasma rockets, where plasma is being used as a fuel. And uh, advantages of this uh, are that it's a low mass, so the higher speeds can be expected and uh, it is hot and it is light. So let me now come to uh, plasma materials and methods. Plasma, so in the laboratory also plasmas are extremely useful. Uh, plasma surfacing is one phenomenon where uh, 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 in the form of plasma nitriding, uh, which uh, uh, protects the material from corrosion. So there is, a, you know, I would all, I always like to mention that uh, uh, in uh, Nepal, uh, in their hydroelectric uh, power uh, projects, uh, they were using these metal uh, pipes and they were corroding. Well, there was a lot of dust in that water and the pipes were getting corroded very soon. Within a year or two years, the pipes were getting corroded. And after this plasma processing, nitriding of the uh, pipes, uh, they have increased their lifetime tremendously. So this is one application of the uh, plasmas surfacing. And there are, of course, these are uh, these applications have been there. Uh, welding, plasma welding, etching, electroplating, you know, uh, putting one material over another material, and thermal vapor deposition, etc. And uh, why does it work? Because high temperature environment, ion production, and acceleration. So these, these are the basic... Uh, you know, mechanisms by which uh, plasma operates on uh, new materials. Plasma chemistry, new materials. So one would like to uh, know by surfacing, by adding uh, uh, electroplating or by adding ions of different uh, strata of materials or making substrata, can one generate new materials? So this is another line of research which is very active. In fact, in the ITER experiment, the tokamak experiment, simultaneously one is also looking for material which can withstand very extremely high temperatures which exist in the uh, center of the plasma. And then in the uh, gasification of hospital waste, you know, waste management is a big problem all over the world. And uh, so plasmas also are being used uh, very efficiently to, for the disposal of uh, hospital waste, plasma-based air and water purifiers are uh, already they already exist. Plasma television and so on, they are, these already are quite popular. Uh, plasmas in medicine. Now, I would like to stress a little bit on this because uh, it's still not very common, and plasmas are being used to uh, you know destroy bacteria in wound infections. In fact, it's also being used in in the treatment of cancer. And it is also a very big area for research right now. Now, it is a cold plasma because although the plasma is hot temperature, but the amount of matter in the plasma is very small. So the heat, total heat content is small. And also it can be focused in a very, very localized area. So it doesn't hurt the neighboring cells. Uh, it it all, almost works at a cellular level. So that's a big advantage of using plasmas in medicine. Plasmas agriculture, you know, this is a very exciting area and where extremely little work is being done. Except the only, as far as I know, uh, China is the only country uh, which is really working on this, uh, you know, wholeheartedly in this area. And uh, what happens here is that uh, there are uh, two or three ways in which plasmas help uh, produce a better quality uh, crop and also faster. So for example, the seeds can be treated uh, with plasma. And it, it, it turns out that uh, if the seeds are kept in, an, in a plasma environment, they grow much faster. Their protein content increases. 
and uh, also the water which is being treated with plasma is called plasma treated water that is extremely useful uh, for uh, irrigating the uh, crops and much more efficient in producing uh, the crop so the ensuing changes in biochemicals like phytohormones phytochemicals and antioxidant levels and also as i mentioned the protein content of the seed increases so i really hope and wish and i have been advertising this for the last couple of years that we should get into this area wherever possible in india only a couple of places at least i know only one place where this work is going on but it needs to be done i think everywhere all over the world uh, and it may help us to mitigate the food problem to some extent so what are the types of plasmas we, as i mentioned there are fully ionized plasmas which means that all the electrons and the positive charges electrons are negatively charged ions are positively charged uh, so the plasma consists only these two types there may be different types of ions but everything there are no neutral particles so that is fully ionized plasma partially ionized plasma would have some neutral particles and i will give you an example of uh, i think later on of uh, each of these classes see for example solar corona which is at million degrees is a fully ionized plasma or center of the sun which is at uh, 15 million degrees is a fully ionized plasma but photosphere which is only at 6000 kelvin it is a partially ionized plasma so it has still some neutral hydrogen atoms and then we have dusty plasmas we in in uh, several locations in uh, in the universe there's lot of dust and by dust we mean uh, uh, graphite or silicon grains uh, macroscopic size grains which exist uh, along with the plasmas <clears throat> and then we have uh, this is just strongly coupled plasmas which are extremely dense for example in white dwarfs or in pulsars uh, extremely compact high density objects strongly coupled plasmas exist and then quantum plasmas is a way of dealing with the plasmas can you deal them in a classical manner or in a quantum mechanical manner so that is uh, the uh, type of uh, statistics one uses to describe the uh, plasma state whether it is to be described by for example maxwell boltzmann distribution with, uh, with uh, which we describe an ordinary for example air in this room so that's a classical uh, statistics but it's at extremely high densities uh, quantum effects become very important and we have to take them into account now this is a picture uh, maybe we spend a few seconds on this um, so this is vertical axis is the temperature it varies from let's say 100 uh, degrees to 100 million 10 to the 8 and uh, x axis is the number density of the charged particles per meter cube and this varies from say 1000 to 10 to the power 33 this is just to uh, uh, you know uh, emphasize that plasmas exist in such a is you know a big variety uh, in a in a uh, such a big range of parameters and that is why uh, different phenomena take place uh, uh, at different uh, densities and temperatures so for example this aurora which i showed you now has a number density of this order temperature of this order and whereas uh, a solar core see this is very high uh, temperature million more than million degrees 10 15 million degrees and uh, density is also extremely high at this and uh, so for example uh, uh, inertial confinement so which i mentioned about the uh, laser fusion uh, so that falls in this portion of this graph and magnetic confinement which is the tokamak uh, fusion device uh, it 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 is it has a density of of this 10 to the 16 17 18 per meter cube and uh, of course temperatures of 100 million degrees and so on so variety and this is a lightning for example when we see lightning so how much uh, uh, what is the density of uh, particles electrons so current is it is basically the measure of current in the system now okay so let me go next defining a plasma so let me see so it's not all talk there are uh, there is some work to be done 
and some mathematics to be uh, applied so that we know how do we calculate quantities. Otherwise, it's just all talk. Um, so let me again define uh, plasma is a mixture of positively and negatively charged particles along with some neutral particles. The term plasma was first suggested by Irving Langmuir in 1939 while studying the electric discharge of gases by passing high electric current through cesium atoms. So as I mentioned, a plasma has very different properties from its parent neutral gas. What are the kind of forces that exist in a plasma? So basically, since these are charged, electrically charged particles, so one would expect that uh, electromagnetic forces are the major forces which operate in a plasma. Then there are collisional forces between different particles because these are very energetic particles. They are moving at high speeds, so they do collide. And uh, so these collisional forces exist. Collisions can be between different particles, as I mentioned. And what are the other forces since plasma is a... Uh, medium, it's, it, it is, as I will mention again, it is a kind of a fluid. Uh, one can study it in the, in the form of a fluid picture. So it has pressure gradient forces and, of course, gravitational forces. Um, anything that has mass has gravitational forces. So what is the main uh, difference between uh, a plasma and a single charged particle? So a single charged particle, as you remember from your high school physics, uh, potential is a single charge Q, potential at a distance R is Q by R, a single single particle. I think this is a high school. And But what happens in a plasma? Because there are so many uh, positive and negative particles, if one has a single particle, let's say this is a uh, positively charged particle, it will attract all the other uh, negatively charged particles around it. So this will, this, this single positive charge is screened from the rest of the plasma by this cloud around this positive charge. The, and the cloud is made up of negatively charged particles because the opposite charges attract. So this is the basic difference. The potential uh, changes from single particle potential to a uh, potential, which is electrostatic potential, in, in the presence of plasma by this uh, form which, which we can calculate and which is observed. So this is the basic thing. You cannot treat uh, a particle as a single particle when it is in a plasma. You have to take into account the effect of all the other particles that are present there. So this is a very big difference because now it is quite complicated how to you know calculate uh, forces between these positive charges and these negative charges. If there are two particles, we can we know there's a distance between them. If there are three particles, we can still do. But these are innumerable number of particles. You know, the densities as I showed, in one centimeter cube, there would, there would be like 10 to the 15 or 18 or 20 particles in one centimeter cube. So how does one estimate the potential? What is the total potential? So we, we cannot treat this as a two-body problem or a three-body problem or, of course, not a single-body problem. So there are techniques, which I will come to, to how to deal with large uh, systems of charged particles. So plasma has a density N, which I mentioned already, temperature T. And this is the cloud which surrounds any single particle is known as the Debye cloud. Debye screening length is proportional to the temperature. If temperature is large, particles will <coughs> withstand the attractive force of this uh, charge. So they can remain away from this charge. But if the density is more, they will try to, uh, there will be more number of particles within this sphere. So, the, so the size of the cloud is determined by the ratio of temperature and the density. So this is a very important parameter. Uh, so once, if, suppose somebody gives you a, a plasma, this is the first thing you should calculate. What's the density? Temperature is given to you. Calculate this parameter. Then say whether it will behave like a plasma or like a single particle. So pl plasma parameter, large number of particles in this sphere. So that is the uh, definition of a plasma. Then plasmas have quasi-neutrality. Why quasi? Uh, see, when we started with the gas, 
it is totally neutral. We ionized, it should still remain neutral because equal number of positive and negative charges. So it is still on the on the whole, it is still neutral. But in small regions, as I mentioned here, there may be some fluctuations. There are some fluctuations where uh, departures from neutrality can exist. So these departures from neutrality, we uh, term them as quasi-neutrality, not strictly neutral, some departure from neutrality. And all electromagnetic phenomena in plasmas exist because of this small departure from uh, plasma neutrality, strict neutrality. So this is, this is an important as, defining aspect of the plasma. So there are so since these particles are very mobile, they have a lot of velocity. They get attracted to this charge, but they may have more uh, energy than to just sit at the charge. They won't just come and sit at the charge. They may overtake. They may overshoot and go to the other area from where again they will be pulled back. So this is a kind of an oscillatory phenomenon where particles are being attracted uh, and repulsed by the charge fluctuations in the system. And any oscillatory phenomena has an associated uh, frequency with it. And in plasmas, we find that this is a very important, the very first uh, thing one looks for uh, is the electron plasma frequency, which is, uh, is, a, uh, is, is just uh, given by the electron density and uh, the mass of the particles. So similarly, since the mass of uh, electrons here in the denominator and the density in the numerator. You know, so this, this defines the electron plasma frequency. So correspondingly, since there are also ions, so why not there's ion plasma frequency also? So the only difference between these two is the charge of the ion may be different. Electron has a unit charge, but ions can have more than one charge. It can be doubly charged, triply charged. And the mass of the ion is also very different. For example, electron mass is extremely small compared to the proton mass. So those masses come in the denominator. So as you can then guess that the electron plasma frequency would be much larger than the ion plasma frequency, which is a relatively lower frequency uh, observed in the plasma. So, so what is the you know application, one application, day-to-day uh, -day application of this phenomena? So refractive index, just like any medium glass has a refractive index, water has a refractive index due to which the bending of light takes place. So similarly, plasmas also have a refractive index, which is defined in this manner. And what does it do? It does, um, uh, uh, for example, for ionospheric uh, wave propagation, it is, it is the deciding factor from where the waves would be, uh, radio waves would be refracted uh, to your receiver. So this is uh, uh, an extremely deciding factor, the plasma density. So waves of different frequencies will be reflected back from different heights of the ionosphere. So the ionosphere, as the density is uh, varying, uh, you know, it first uh, increases and then again it decreases. So varying density, it will decide where the short wave uh, ionospheric wave propagation uh, will take place. And this is how we learn about the ionosphere as well as we receive our radio signals. Now, as I mentioned that uh, since uh, charged particles, there are electrons. And uh, so there are, uh, wherever there is a uh, current, there is magnetic field. So some additional, because of the motion of the particles in the magnetic field, additional frequencies come into uh, picture. So these are, this is, they are defined by the cyclotron motion of the ions and the electrons. So in plasmas, not all the species, be, I will now speed up a little bit, uh, behave alike. They can have different temperatures. Anisotropic temperature, it's not that plasma is just one temperature. This is actually a very important property of the plasmas, that they can have different temperatures, even in the direction. You know, in some one direction, plasma temperature is a scalar, but in plasmas, it can behave like a vector. Particle interactions, as I mentioned, are more often than not collective. No single particle. All the particles uh, behave in a very cooperative manner. Uh, techniques for studying plasmas and plasma phenomena. So basically, all the laws of uh, uh, laws of conservation are applied in order to study plasmas. So mass conservation, momentum conservation, energy conservation. 
along with laws of electrodynamics. So this is the basic mathematical structure which uh, or, or formalism which one can use to understand the plasma phenomena. So then there are different levels of descriptions, the kinetic dis description of a plasma. It can be the, all the plasma particles can be described by a distribution, something like a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, or they can, uh, they can be uh, treated like fluids. So one example where uh, kinetic description is used is uh, solar radio emission, where we get uh, very high energy uh, emission from the sun in the, at the radio wavelength, and it is transitory. It is a, uh, has a short lifetime in a, in a kind of a bursty manner. And so this is actually totally explained by the uh, plasma phenomenon. And this, another example is the radiation wells, which I think some of you must be familiar, and where the particles, high energy solar particles, are trapped in the Earth's magnetic field. And these radiation belts are observed. Uh, satellite observations have been done, and we know quite a bit about that. And then we also actually derive uh, what kind of particle distributions uh, can exist, in, can actually account for these radiation belts. Uh, plasmas and radiation have a symbiotic relationship. Charged particles, accelerated charged particles uh, give radiation. So all sources of radiation uh, in the universe are through the plasmas. Plasmas, it is plasmas that emit radiation. Uh, either as a, one can have a single particle radiation from atoms, but more often than not, it is a plasma radiation. Fluid description of a plasma, number of fluids in a plasma is the number of species of particles in the plasmas. So for example, a plasma with electron and ions have to, have to, can be treated as two fluids. A plasma with electrons, ions, and neutrals have three fluids. So this is a different level of uh, description from particles to fluids. And fluids are defined by mass density and velocity and pressure and so on. So um, <clears throat> Plasmas exhibit a variety of waves, as I already mentioned, some of them. So these are electrostatic, electromagnetic, quasi-longitudinal, quasi-transverse. So basically electromagnetic waves, as you have already, all, have, all of you must have studied, are transverse waves. But when they exist in a plasma, they lose their uh, true uh, transverse uh, polarization. They can be quasi-transverse or quasi-longitudinal. Uh, so these are different uh, uh, methods for studying plasmas. The fluid phenomena, for example, is uh, useful for studying the large scale behavior of plasma. So for example, for modeling these uh, solar coronal loops, we use them as fluids, not as single particle, not as distribution. So these are all large scale plasma phenomena, tails. And these are extra galactic jets uh, exactly in um, other galaxies. Uh, huge uh, distances uh, away, and this is all uh, plasma jets, which are you know these long lines are plasma jets, and uh, it's one of the problems is how they can uh, these jets can you know stay uh, without uh, getting uh, diffuse in, in the environment. They maintain their integrity over uh, you know millions of kilometers. So this is one of the challenges. Uh, in this field. Uh, waves, uh, so then different fluid uh, description, three fluids. So summarizing, plasmas are the beginnings of the universe. Plasmas are here and everywhere. Plasma phenomena on several spatial and time scales. Spatial, as I mentioned, densities, temperatures, uh, uh, lambda d, the de Bailand scale, uh, frequencies of the, all the waves. The configurations, which I just showed the picture, it could be a loop, it could be a jet, uh, cosmic magnetic fields, how to generate cosmic magnetic fields, how do they sustain themselves over uh, billions of years, all come in the purview of plasmas. Uh, radiation processes, new materials, agriculture, medicine, you name it, it's there. So I think uh, just, just I could was able to give you, I hope, or just a taste a glimpse into what a variety of uh, phenomena exist in plasmas and from laboratory to the earliest uh, stages of the universe. And also uh, specifically, I would again stress on in medicine and in agriculture. I think that is the areas which need to be investigated and in future areas of research in this area. Thank you so much. 
Thank you, Vinod. That was extremely insightful and thought provoking indeed. Uh, so I learned a lot by just listening to your talk. And of course, I've been reading your book. Uh, so maybe I could uh, probably go over a few questions with you. Uh, so uh, you mentioned clean energy and uh, you, you mentioned that we are kind of moving that uh, mark where we can actually start harnessing it. What are the main problems uh, or what are the main challenges in harnessing a clean energy from plasma? Yeah. So <clears throat> as you recall that uh, in the interior of the sun, gives you know, high density and high temperature. So this is the requirement for the fusion reactions to take place. Now in the sun is the gravity that helps us, that confines the plasma, that keeps it dense and hot. In the laboratory, this 10, 15, 100 million degrees temperature and density, we cannot have the same kind of confinement in the laboratory. So what we do is we try to use the magnetic fields. Because if you uh, know uh, magnetic fields can confine the plasmas by keep just keeping it. Uh, so what happened, you know, when we first uh, uh, entered into this game, uh, we thought, you know, very strong magnetic fields can keep the plasma together. But it turned out that the plasma can leave because the, there is a free movement of particles along the magnetic field. Perpendicular to the magnetic field, they are in circular motion, so they can keep confined. But along the magnetic field, they can leave the system. So what we did, we turned the magnetic field into a torus. So now all magnetic configurations are in the form of a torus. So the particles should remain. That was, uh, you know, one problem was solved, but many arose. Because of the curvature of the magnetic field, many instabilities came into the system. But I can tell you now that at the present uh, moment, we have been able to, um, you know, uh, take care of all those instabilities, which are large scale MHD, as I mentioned, you know, fluid phenomena instabilities we have been able to take care. But there is still a lot of turbulence in the plasma because it's such a, you know, volatile system. <laughs> so, yeah, so this is the kind of, you know, challenges like what materials, first of all, what's the container? For 15, 100 million degrees, what 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 material can uh, you know sustain that temperature? Withstand that temperature? No. So we you know so that problem was solved by magnetic fields, but then that gave rise to other problems. Other problems. Yeah. And then this you know the outcome of the uh, uh, fusion reactions is a very high energetic part neutrons and helium. So these these so it is the neutrons which are emitted from the uh, nuclear reactions, that has the energy which we want to harness. So okay. we, we storage for them. What's the blankets for them? How to convert that into uh, efficient way of using the energy? That's so there's, there's still a lot of challenges. That makes sense. So, I mean, while we are, uh, say, assume we come to a point where we start harnessing this energy, do you see any downsides to that? Or would we ever come back to a situation where, uh, like we are today with fossil fuels and there's a carbon mm. footprint and all these uh, issues, do you yeah. think if we completely switch to uh, plasma fuel, for instance, that we could end up in some kind of uh, similar uh, irreversible path? Uh, as of now, no. Uh, but I think uh, we don't know enough yet. And uh, so uh, when the game was started, it was like totally clean and, you know, car it is certainly carbon free. Because that question is not there. Right. It is certainly carbon free. And a bit of radioactivity may be a problem, but not as much as in fission and uh, uncontrolled uh, fusion reactions, not as much. Uh, managing these new high energy neutrons is still a question. That makes sense. Mm. Thanks. So, uh, also, I was uh, wondering. I mean, you mentioned in a book that in your book that uh, I think when antimatter and matter combine, they produce radiation. And you mm. also say that uh, you antiparticles and antimatter uh, that you know there's a subtle difference between particles mm. and antiparticles, and that's what allowed the universe to evolve. Hmm. So when we do these experiments, is there a possibility that it could reverse and, you know, could we have more antimatter and matter? Uh, my understanding from your book is that antimatter and matter annihilate each other. So yes. is That's it possible right. that, uh, you know, uh, that could be reversed because it's not very well understood? And what are the implications to... Uh, no, actually, you know what it? we... Yeah, yeah, good question. 
uh, what we uh, know as of today is uh, uh, matter and antimatter definitely annihilate that there's no doubt about that but the question is why is the predominance of matter or antimatter so everything should have disappeared right. why are we here why are we here so these are the you know this question is uh, there's no answer to this question as of now there are speculations there are models and uh, they are being disproved <laughs> rather than proved every other day and the experiments which you mentioned uh, you know very small amounts of antimatter has been produced under extreme conditions and this antimatter has been found to be extremely unstable I it doesn't see. even last for a I would not say fraction of a second, but much, much less than a fraction of a second. And what happens to this is that it immediately decays into other matter. Oh, okay. It doesn't stay in its own uh, natural state uh, long enough for us to study it. So what people have done, you know, like, okay, there is an anti, you know, the hydrogen atom has an electron and a proton. So an anti-hydrogen atom would have an anti-electron and anti-proton. Right, this is an anti hydrogen right. atom. So, people have looked whether does so this has been achieved. So, will this have a different uh, spectroscopic signatures than the hydrogen atom? Mm -hmm. Yeah, hasn't been found, hasn't been oh, found. Okay. They look alike, there's their spectral signatures are alike. So, uh, so right now, the only uh, hope is that uh, the way the matter decays into its component, other particles and the antimatter decays into other particles, there may be some difference there. And people are trying to look into that right now. Thanks. Um, so what can uh, you know engineers like us at Google do to get involved? How can we uh, like help further research in this field? Yeah, so you know, as I mentioned, I think, see this energy production, et cetera, uh, nuclear fusion, these are very, very huge projects. You know, like they are, as I said, you know, of the whole 30 countries, there is a European uh, consortium. It's called a joint uh, European, it's called JET, Joint European Tokamak. So the whole of Europe has one Tokamak, big, very big Tokamak. It's just maybe next to, next lower than ITER. So these are extremely huge and a lot of uh, effort and everything has gone into it. And they are at a certain level of, uh, achievement, success. Uh, but I would certainly say agriculture and medicine. I would certainly love to see more people investigating, you know, these aspects of plasmas. That makes That's sense. Good. Thank you. Uh, so I, another uh, question I've had, I've been curious all along. What is it that, uh, you know, causes uh, a plasma to have mass or gravity for that matter? So, I mean, is it what force causes that? So, you, I mean, like a, you have interstellar plasma, you have the sun. But why is yeah. the sun so massive? Whereas that's yeah. just like a gas. Yeah. How does that yeah. work? <laughs> so that is gravity. You know, actually, so the one asked the question how the star was formed. In the beginning, it was all gas. So how these clumps came together to become these high density regions, become stars, ignite themselves, react, nuclear reactions started, it became a star. So what is the transition from a very diffuse gas to a star? Right. right? So there are a lot of processes. So basically it is the gravity. So some fluctuations somewhere in the universe in fact, there's an, another whole area of investigation. Uh, you know, although we uh, started with the expansion of the universe, which is all, all regions of the universe are, are expanding equally. So why should there be more matter in one region than in another region? It should have all just a uniform diffusion. Right. It is not. So in fact, great that it is not. And that is why we are here. That is why the stars and galaxies and everything has formed. So basic difference between interstellar matter, which is very thin, low density, and a star is the density. And with density becomes mass. With mass comes gravity. Thank you. That's so plasma, actually, you are very right. Uh, let me also qualify a little bit. Laboratory plasmas are very thin. 
see actually so what is the mass of in a plasma is the mass of the proton right Ma mass of the electron is very small mass of the proton or ions well let's say hydro in for example if you have hydrogen plasma is the mass of the proton so in uh, you can actually do as sum i can give you a sum so the density is less let's say 10 to the 10 particles 10 to the 10 protons per centimeter cube how much is the mass in one centimeter right right yeah that right? seems mind. Uh, mind blowing yeah it's very small so in laboratory plasmas do not have so much of gravitational effect uh, it is very, very, gravitation anyway is the weakest force in the universe. So laboratory plasmas do not have uh, gravity as the one of the forces. But having said that, we also have very uh, sensitive instruments to measure even uh, like a millionth of the acceleration uh, due to gravity of the Earth. That kind of sensitive instruments. Sir. But plasmas is even less than so gravity is not important in laboratory plasmas. So you need is you need a sun. Right. Thank you. That's that's insightful indeed. Um, so I think with that we are out of time. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Vinod, for being here and taking us through this amazing journey. You've been an inspiration. And I'm sure you'll continue to be an inspiration to all of us. And uh, I'd like to again thank you for being here. And I hope with this talk, we've sparked thought, thought and conversations around this intriguing subject. Okay. Uh, thanks so much, everybody, again. Um, thank you. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I think you have done a great pleasure. job. You have done a great job of homework. Your homework was done very well. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. My pleasure. Okay. So